Hello, I'm Glenn Heemstra from Futurist.com. I'm talking today with Brenda Cooper. Brenda has a varied background. She is a chief information officer in her technology career. She is a science fiction writer, a recognized award-winning science fiction writer, and she is a professional futurist and has worked with Futurist.com for many years from the very beginning, as a matter of fact. She was there when we started and continues to do presentations as a futurist to write as a futurist as well as a science fiction writer. Hi, Brenda. Hi, Glenn. How are you? I'm good. And uh, I'm so glad to talk to you. Uh, how are you mixing all these things together? You've got the IT career, you've got the science fiction writing career, you've got the futurist career. How do they all fit together for you? They actually fit together a little better than you might think. It's a lot of work to keep up on all of them, but if I'm re researching something for the future, that often works in um, perfectly well because I'll come up with a story idea out of that that I'll then be able to work into either a book or a story. The research I do for my futurist talks also helps me out as a chief information officer because I often want to know what's going to be happening culturally in the next five or ten years in order to determine what technology to implement and how to make that work. Brenda, in her science fiction career, is the author of um, several books, actually. She was the, the co-author with a, with a well-known science fiction writer. You might talk about that in a minute. But uh, of uh, a series that she's been working on now. The third book is coming out before too long. The first one is called The Silver Ship and the Sea. The second one is called Reading the Wind. Uh, and I just want to make sure we make note of that. And I want to talk a little bit about, or have you talk a little bit about science fiction writing related to futurism or the futurist movement. When I started as a professional futurist, and you know this because we've talked about this a lot, uh, professional futurists kind of kept science fiction at an arm's length, feeling like they shouldn't be known as connected to science fiction. And you and I have agreed that there's actually a very close relationship and a lot of uh, reinforcement between the two. How do you see or how do you use the connections between what you learn in the science fiction community and what you learn in the futurist community and then the, how you put that into your work? An awful lot of science fiction comes from ideas that we read in science or that we read even sometimes I pick up something in the newspaper. I recently wrote a story because I read about some concern about some robotics that are being developed in Japan and that those might be used in order to babysit children. So I actually wrote a story out of that based on robotic robots babysitting a girl. And so a lot of times science fiction is a way to take an idea or a piece of science that's being worked on, extrapolate that into what that's going to look like or make our culture look like in five years, ten years, or twenty years. And even science fiction that's set further off in the future, such as this series in The Silver Ship and the Sea, I ask a fundamental question about genetics that I think we're going to need to be able to answer for ourselves. And that is, if we are already prejudiced often about simple things like race, um, skin color, languages people speak, class, what's going to happen when we're really different? Because with genetic engineering, we may be able to create people that will actually be faster or smarter or perhaps better climbers, a number of different things people may end up being engineered in order to do. People who are engineered in order to go to space may become different than humans who stay behind on Earth, for example. And so in this series, what I do is I take a look at that by putting six genetically engineered children down on a colony planet that has perfectly valid reasons for not wanting any genetic engineering and that call themselves original humans. And then I spin out the story from there as to how do these two groups well, see, that, that, That's my experience with, with science fiction writers like yourself who are also futurists in that you do a better job, I think, than the average futurist, to tell you the truth, of really thinking through the social, cultural, and even personal implications. I mean, a typical futurist will say genetic engineering is going to be a big deal, but it doesn't really go much beyond that. And you really ask at a much deeper level, so what does this really mean? And uh, recently I was doing a program with uh, uh, a group of people interested in Olympic uh, athletics and professional athletics and so on. And we were talking about the probability that there might be the need to have sort of a non-genetically engineered in Olympics and a genetically engineered Olympics mm -hmm. because it will be so hard to differentiate between those two. It would be possible, but it would be easy to hide that stuff. What are some other... Uh, things beyond biology that you talk about now in your futurist presentations or in your writing as well that you're seeing as important trends that uh, you're thinking about in terms of their implications for the future? Well, certainly there are the technology trends, things like augmented reality where we'll be able to have um, pieces of perhaps a virtual reality meeting so that someone else could be in the same room with us and it would feel very real and as if we were talking with them 
Um, I just read today in the paper, in fact, about a baseball card company working on some baseball cards where they'll have the baseball players pop up and hit the ball in the air as a way to make the wow. baseball cards become more attractive. Yeah. Uh, so I think there's an awful lot of interesting stuff going on in technology and in new user interface engineering. One of the things they're working on at Microsoft that I was up looking at recently um, because I got invited to TechFest Day Zero up there, and they were oh, talking. Wow. Yeah, it was very cool. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> they were talking about what they call um, a natural user interface. So instead of thinking it's a human user interface, and we sort of lug these computers around with us all the time, a natural user interface may mean that your computer and your computing access is all around you all of the time. Well, and here's another question though, that I have for you as a woman futurist. It's actually fairly rare to see a woman futurist. Most of the professional futurist community are men. Mm -hmm. uh, and we get calls every now and then at futurist.com and they're attracted to having you come and speak because they'd like to have a kind of woman's perspective or a female perspective. Uh, what do you see when you kind of look through, let's say alternative eyes at the future? Do you bring a, a certain perspective that you think is helpful or different? I think that women probably look a little bit more at the longer term picture of how is this potentially going to affect us as a culture, affect our communication, perhaps affect our children and our society. Um, many ways I think we look at things the same. I don't really believe that men and women are completely different in how they look at things. But based on all of the studies about how we communicate, it says that women communicate a little bit differently and a little bit more globally and a little bit more in a group and a little bit less competitively. And I think that's probably a look that I'm able to bring. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. I'm Glenn Heemster from Futurist.com. I've been talking with Brenda Cooper, an associate of Futurist.com. For more information on Brenda as a speaker, uh, contact us at uh, Futurist.com. We'll be glad to provide you more information. Thank you very much. Thank you.